Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to today's lecture on the history of railways. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Tsanakakis. I am working at Rail Baltica Rail uh, and I am the operation and maintenance team leader. Uh, the influence of railways on human civilization is massive, revolutionizing the way we travel, trade and connect with each other. Over the centuries, railways have uh, reshaped enormous landscapes, powered economic growth, and shaped significant social and cultural changes. Let's go together along this fascinating trip through time as we uncover the fascinating story of railways, their impact on societies, and the lasting imprint they have left on the world. Welcome to the history of railways. The lecture today will begin with the ancient track roads dating back to 600 before Christi, followed by the emergence of modern railways in the early 19th century with the development of the first steam locomotive. We will focus on high speed trains that revolutionized transportation, including a brief overview of Maglev and the Hyperloop technology. Finally, there will be a brief introduction to the railway history of the Baltic countries and Rail Baltica Rail, and we will conclude with a funny story about the railway track goals. So let's start. First of all, I would like to ask you to scan the code you see, so you will be linked to Slido where you can uh, uh, put your questions. And also I will ask you a few questions, you can put uh, uh, also your answers. So please scan it and then we can start. So railway, as we discussed it, an efficient transport mean and the mo history of modern railways can be tracked uh, back to the early of the 19th century when uh, the first locomotive, uh, steam locomotive, was developed. The development of railways revolutionized transportation, commerce and industry as it allowed people and goods to be transported faster and in a more efficient way than ever before. Than ever before. The first public railway was built in uh, 1804 in England. It was a tramway, horse-drawn tramway, that ran between the towns of Wandsworth and Crowdon. It's about 15 kilometers. 20 years later, in 1825, the first steam-powered public railway was opened in, in England, running between Stockton and Darlington. It's a distance about 19 kilometers. This was followed by the Liverpool to Manchester Railway in uh, 1830, that means five years later, a distance of about 50 kilometers which was the first railway to carry passengers and goods by use of steam locomotives. The railway system quickly expanded through Europe, Asia and North America and new lines have been built connecting the major uh, cities and industrial areas. Today, uh, railways continue to play a vital role uh, in transportation commerce now we have a lot of high-speed trains that are connecting cities around the world and also freight trains that are carrying goods across continents. You see here the world map. Uh, we have uh, Europe with a very dense uh, railway network, as like in USA, most the east part of USA, uh, a little bit in South America, in India, in China and Japan, China spent a lot of money and have built a lot of uh, tracks, high-speed uh, lines in the recent uh, years. And uh, a little bit less in South Africa and uh, uh, Australia. Now, before we start the history of railways, we have to, uh, to tell you that railway is a type of guided transport system. What does it mean guide the transport system? The system guides the movement of vehicles. Uh, a first question to you. When did humans first use guided transportation systems? 
if you scan the QR code, you can put your answer in the Slido. What do you think? How old is the use of guided transportation systems? Okay, we can stop now. We can see the answers. Uh, 17th century. Uh, so let's see. Let's go on and see. According to archaeologists, the whale was probably invented about uh, 8,000 before Christi in Asia. So the oldest will that has been discovered was in Mesopotamia about 3,500 years before Christi. That means five and a half thousand years from now in Mesopotamia where now is Iraq. So all began with the invention of the will. How it uh, has been developed. Initially, the humans on that time, they used rollers, then sledges, then have put the sledges on rollers. Uh, the use of the sledges on the roller, uh, we ca it became uh, grooved uh, by use. Then uh, they have put uh, the wheel axles in one piece. The axle was fixed with pegs, with poles. And finally, the wheels joined the axle. So in order to have railways, we need to have, of course, the wheels. Here you see uh, the oldest wheel we found in Europe is 5.2 thousand years old. It was discovered in Ljubljana in Slovenia. The wheel have a distance uh, of uh, 140 centimeters wide and a distance of uh, 100 centimeters long. So what are the earliest traces of track roads? The idea of using track roads is at least 2000 years old. The people in the ancient time, ancient civilization realized that vehicles with wheels can run more efficiently and also need less maintenance if they are guided using grooves cuts into the stone blocks of the roads. In quarries in ancient Greece, Malta, and the Roman Empire, uh, they used cut stone tracks to haul loads pulled by animals. We can find uh, evidence of this uh, first, let's say, rail lines uh, used to guide chariots and wagons in the Greek and Roman empires. Uh, we can find them in Greece and Italy. But the earliest evidence of a wagon way, a predecessor of the railway that has been found so far is a section six to eight, five, 8.5 kilometers, the Diolkos wagon way in Greece, which transported boats across the Isthmus of Corinth in Greece. It's about 600 years before Christi. So you see here Greece, the Isthmus of Corinth, explain what uh, is used. It's a canal nowadays. You see how it looks uh, now. It is a canal that has been built uh, 100 plus years ago, but uh, in the ancient time was not a canal. The canal is used by ships to avoid, I will show in the map, uh, to go around Peloponnese. And to the back you can see uh, a metal gauge train that was linking Athens with uh, the Peloponnese uh, Peninsula. Uh, that is not anymore existing because a new high speed a new high speed line has been constructed. So uh, you see here the ships in the, the they need to go following the red line to go to the Ionian island and then uh, and Ionian sea and then to Italy, or it was faster to go through the Corinth uh, uh, canal now canal to go then to Italy, to West. Um, it was uh, a, a long way and also dangerous 
to uh, go around the Peloponnese Peninsula. And it was used uh, for transfer of goods, but in case, in times of war, it was also used to uh, accelerate the transport of ships uh, uh, from one side to the other side. Uh, it is uh, an elementary form of railway and operated from 600 before Christi, remaining in regular and frequent service for about 650 years. Uh, it combined two principles, the railway and the, the overland transport of ships. It's uh, something that is unique in ancient times. And according to a British historian, uh, Lewis, the deal cost presented a railway a kind of railway in the basic sense of a prepared track which guides the vehicles running on it. So they are guided and cannot leave the track. Uh, interesting is that this uh, has been open to all on payment. So it was a kind of public railway, a concept uh, uh, that according to this uh, historian, Lewis uh, uh, did not reoccur until uh, uh, 1,800 uh, after Christmas, until recently. Uh, also interesting is that the ever gauge is around 160 centimeter, not very far, not very, very different from the gauge uh, today. You can see here some, uh, uh, this uh, trackway that is still existing. You can visit it, uh, it's not very far from Athens. And uh, let's uh, play one video to see how they has been used. of the sea.
Okay, we can continue. So let's uh, have a quick uh, view of the railways. Uh, uh, we see here a minecart from the sixth uh, century. It's an early example of uh, unpowered rail transport. Uh, it has been uh, used for many years, started from 1550 uh, with wagonways or tramways where uh, wooden rails have been used and uh, uh, horses has uh, been pulling uh, the, uh, the, wagon, the wagons um, to facilitate transportation mainly to and from the mines. So they soon became popular in Europe. In, 15, in uh, 1515, uh, uh, Cardinal Matthäus Lang uh, wrote a description of Reiszug. There is a funicular railway close to Salzburg in Hohen Salzburg Fortress in Austria. Uh, this uh, line still existing, of course, not in the same form. Uh, initially, in 1515, uh, used uh, wooden rails and uh, uh, the wagons has been hauled by ropes uh, operated by humans or animals. As mentioned, the uh, line still exists and remains operational, of course, in updated form. And it may be the oldest operational railway. You see here a track uh, with, with wooden rails. So uh, from the wooden rails, then later on, about 200 years later in 1760s, the Colbrookdale Company in UK, they began uh, to use uh, plates of cast iron and fix them in the upper surface of wooden rails. So on this uh, way, they increase the durability and the long bearing ability of the tracks. Uh, the system that has been introduced uh, uh, was L-shaped metal plates uh, known as plateways. A plateway is an early kind of railway, tramway or wagonway, where the rails are made from cast iron. So they used these plateways for about 50 years until 1830. You see here a replica of a little Eton tramway. The rails have L, L cross section and the wheels have no flange. That means uh, the plate ways they guided uh, this uh, uh, wagon. Um, so initially they have been used by horses to pull the wagons, but later on uh, with uh, cables and small locomotives. So the evolution of the transport means. So everything started with horse-drawn railway. Uh, the horse-drawn railway started uh, in coal mines, but uh, then soon they started to carry uh, passengers also. We see here the Swansea and Mumbles Railway in UK and Wales. That was the world's first passenger horse car railway service. It uh, uh, transported people by paying tickets, very fair paying uh, railway passengers. Uh, and it started with an agreement that was effective from March 1807. It later uh, used uh, steam locomotives and uh, then they converted to electric uh, with electric power. Uh, it was in operation until 1960 then the line has been closed in favor of uh, buses. We see here two examples of uh, horse-drawn railway that has been used for personal transport. Using the left side, on the left uh, photo, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a coach, and here you see uh, two coaches, one behind the other. So it is uh, uh, used for personal uh, transport also. So later on, uh, we have the steam power introduced. The first uh, working model of a steam rail locomotive was designed and constructed in the United States by John Fitch in 1794. But Richard Trevithick, he was uh, an engineer in the uh, United Kingdom who uh, has uh, built the full-scale working railway steam locomotive in 1804. 
And uh, um, on the same year, on 21st of February, uh, then uh, this uh, locomotive was hauling hold 10 tons of iron and 70 men, men about uh, in a distance about 10 miles. The speed was eight kilometers per hour. Can we play the video, please? Can we see the video? Here. A So another very successful uh, steam locomotive was uh, the Salamanca, built by Matthew Morris. He, it was built in 1812. Uh, George Stephenson in 18, uh, 1814, inspired by the other locomotives uh, that had been built and presented, uh, he uh, talk, uh, persuaded the manager of uh, a coal mine in Killingworth uh, where he's working uh, to build a steam locomotive, steam powered machine. So he has built the Blucher, that is one of the first successful flanked wheel locomotives. The video, please. So in uh, 1825, uh, uh, he built the same, George Stephenson built the locomotion, and it was the first public steam railway in the world. Uh, it was used by the Stockton and Darlington Railway in Northeast England. So the next step of the steam locomotives uh, is the diesel and electric engines. Uh, they are using uh, um, a generator powered by diesel engine to produce electricity and uh, uh, use electric powered uh, machine to uh, motor to uh, for the electric locomotive. So they are cleaner, they are more efficient, they are need uh, less maintenance than steam locomotives, and also they don't need so skilled personnel in order to operate. So. After uh, some uh, difficulties, technical difficulties, beginning of 19th, uh, 19th, uh, 19th uh, they have been the mainstream, especially after the Second War, World War. And uh, they have been replaced by um, electric power, these electric power locomotives. They replaced all steam uh, power locomotives by 1970. That means uh, steam locomotive after 1970 is difficult to find, not in Europe at least. So the next is the high-speed railway. So the high-speed railway development began in Germany uh, more than 100 years ago, in 1899. It was a company, Zupin and Charlier of Deutz, who built two different rail cars. One rail car fitted uh, with equipment from Siemens and Halske, and the second from AEG, Allgemeine Elektrizitätsgesellschaft. They have been tested in uh, 1902 and 1903. In 1903, the one rail car reached a speed of 207 kilometers per hour almost, and uh, um, a few days later, the other uh, IEG equipment rail car achieved 210 kilometers per hour. And uh, it was 120 years ago. Those trains uh, demonstrated the feasibility of electric high speed rails. However, uh, it took uh, more than 30 years in order to have uh, really electric high speed trains uh, traveling. 
in Germany again, also in, uh, on 15 May 1930, uh, 1933, the Deutsche Reichsbahn Gesellschaft, uh, they introduced a diesel powered Fliegender Hamburger, that means the flying Hamburger, uh, to connect uh, Hamburg and Berlin, that is the distance about 209 kilometers, with a top speed of 160 kilometers per hour. So it was a success. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, they developed, uh, introduced in June uh, 36, that means three years later, uh, also a service from Berlin to Dresden with a regular top speed of 160 km per hour. Um, so those uh, flying trains, the Fliegende Züge, uh, they have been used uh, in uh, many uh, uh, lines across uh, Germany. Uh, all those services stopped uh, in August 19, 1939 before the outbreak of uh, the Second World War. The video, please. Excuse me for the Hamburger. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, uh, in May 1934, uh, after the introduction of the Flingeder Hamburger, uh, in, U in USA, uh, they uh, developed Zephyr that uh, was running uh, with 120, 40, 124 kilometers per hour with a top speed of 185. The new service inaugurated uh, uh, on the same year, 1934, in November, traveling between Kansas City and Lincoln uh, at lower speed than the record. The average speed was uh, for, uh, 74 kilometers per hour. Uh, five years later, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad introduced a double system engine, class S1, what was designed, uh, which was designed to uh, haul 1,200 uh, 1, tons of, passenger, uh, of passengers, uh, passenger trains with a speed of 161 kilometers per hour. In Italy now, uh, after the success of the German high-speed services, uh, this, uh, in 1938, they developed the multiple unit ETR 200, that was designed to run at speed 200 kilometers per hour between Bologna and Naples. It reached 160 kilometers per hour in commercial service and achieved a world mean speed record of 203 kilometers per hour in the same year, in 1938. We see the photo of this uh, Italian train. In UK, on the same year, 1938, uh, it was a steam locomotive Mallard that achieved a speed of uh, 202.58 kilometers per hour. But uh, the hull, the engines, and the boilers on the steam locomotives were large, heavy, and very intensive to maintain. And uh, um, the days for the steam, uh, use of steam locomotives for high speed uh, uh, were numbered. In France, uh, in early 1950s, the French National Railway started to receive uh, a new uh, type of electric locomotives and began to study to and evaluate the running to, uh, to run at higher speeds. In 
type uh, was hauling a full train and achieved a record of uh, 243 kilometers per hour during a test on a standard track. One year later, uh, two uh, electric locomotives, they uh, broke uh, the previous speed records, reaching 320 and 331 kilometers per hour, again on standard track. So for the first time, the speed of 300 kilometers per hour was surpassed, allowing the idea of higher speed services to be developed and further engineering services started. In Japan, the Tokyo Osaka corridor is about 500 kilometers. On this corridor, were, were living about 45 million people. So it was a huge congestion on the road and the rail. So the Japanese government began thinking about developing a new high speed rail service. Uh, in 1955, engineers from Japanese National Railways visited for six months uh, SNCF, the uh, France, uh, French Railway Company. And uh, after the six months, they came back to Japan with a number of ideas and technologies. And uh, they started some uh, tests. Uh, and uh, then they started the construction of the first section in April 59. Four years later, in 1963, they uh, constructed a new track and they started test runs with a top speed of 256 kilometers per hour. Uh, in 64, in October, just before the league begins, the Tokaido Shinkansen was opened connecting Osaka, Tokyo, and Osaka. We can see on the right, the original uh, Shikansen train that has been introduced in 64. So uh, later on, they developed uh, the first bullet trains with 12 cars and then 16 cars and even double deck trains to increase the capacity. And after three years, they had over 100 million passengers that used the trains. And they reached the milestone of 1 billion passengers, 1 billion passengers in 1976. You see here some newer models of Shinkansen. Now, after this success, it was evolution in Europe. Following uh, uh, 95, 1955 records, uh, two divisions of SNS began to study high speed services. In 1964, SNCF investigated the use of gas turbines, and then we have the TGV, Turbo Train Grand Vitesse, a train that uses gas turbines. That means diesel powered rail cars, rail cars modified with a gas turbine. They reached in uh, 1967 a speed of 230 kilometers per hour, and in 1981, they started. Uh, on the on the Paris Lyon high speed line, a speed of 260 kilometers, a top speed. Later they increased. Uh, so after the introduction of TGV, as expected, the air traffic uh, on routes where TGV was running decreased and some some cases disappeared because the train was faster than the plane. You can see now a video with uh, the uh, TGV record, but before the video, uh, to say that the TGV has uh, a speed record in 81 with 300 kilometers per hour, in 1990, 515 kilometers per hour, and in 2007, and you can see here the video, reaching almost 575 kilometers per hour. Oui, nous sommes prêts. La du haut, est-tu prêt Nous sommes prêts. Daniel à la cabine pour la marche 093-02, départ. Départ, Daniel, bien reçu. Messieurs, c'est parti.
the test was on a normal track. de tous. Après contrôle et validation, la valeur officielle de la vitesse atteinte dans notre marche est de 574,8 km h Je répète, 574,8 km h Oui, thank you. Oh, uh, the maximum operating speed now of the Shinkansen in Japan is uh, 320 km per hour, and the TGV has a top speed also of 320 km per hour in commercial service. Let's see the uh, evolution of the speed increase in the last, uh, in the past 130 years. We started uh, in 1890 with 144 kilometers. Then we reached the beginning of uh, last century uh, the speed of uh, 210 kilometers, uh, then 80 years later, 380 kilometers per hour, and then in 2007, we reached uh, 575 kilometers per hour, as uh, uh, we saw in the video now, this uh, test. Uh, you see the high-speed rail in Europe, the existing also in development, you see is a very extensive high-speed uh, railway a network that is already uh, constructed or planned in, uh, in Europe. Um, you, now we see the length of high-speed railway lines in operation in 2021. Uh, the biggest network is in China. The Chinese have developed in the last 20 years very extensive uh, high-speed railway network. Uh, also, same with Spain. Then it's Japan and France. A summary of the high-speed railway. 
So starting, as we discussed with first in Kansen train uh, that uh, connected Tokyo and Osaka in 64, high-speed rail uh, that was running about 300 kilometers per hour has been built in Spain, in France, in Germany, in Italy, in China, Taiwan, United States, United Kingdom, South Korea, Scandinavia, Belgium, and Netherlands. Uh, sorry, not above. It's uh, 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 high speed, uh, on high speed, up to and above 300 kilometers per hour. So, as already mentioned, this uh, high speed and the short distances, they resulted in the decline of short haul flights between several uh, cities, for example, between Boston, New York, Washington, between London, Paris, Brussels, Madrid, Barcelona, and other lines. So, uh, considering the climate change and global warming, warning, uh, warming and the surge of energy, high-speed rail is supposed to be the key for the future of uh, transportation in many countries in the world. You see here uh, the, uh, on the left side, the market share and uh, in the horizontal line, the travel time by trains. If the train uh, can run and uh, cover uh, the distances in one and a half, five hours, then almost uh, uh, has 100% share. But even with two hours travel distance, they have uh, maybe 80, 85% of market share. With three hours travel distance, for example, Paris, London, the market share is almost uh, 70 percent. Uh, the the high-speed trains uh, can really uh, play a very big role in transportation. I will briefly go through. The trains uh, is based on uh, two sets of electromagnets, one set uh, to repel and push the train off the track, and other to move the elevated train ahead. Uh, the race is about 10 centimeters of the track, and they are used both uh, for uh, um, high speed, that means over 400 kilometers per hour, but also for lower speed, uh, 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, there is not a bit success of the maglev uh, technology. There are only six operational trains today, three in China, two in South Korea, and one in Japan. So uh, in, uh, uh, in Japan, uh, initially started with a test track of 43 kilometers. And uh, then uh, they are planning to use uh, uh, maglev trains to link Tokyo and Osaka in uh, 2037. Uh, it's as mentioned about 500 kilometers per hour, but also a part of that, uh, also from Tokyo to uh, Nagoya, uh, that uh, plan to be operational in four years from now. The average speed is anticipated to be 500 kilometers per hour. Now the tourists can uh, uh, use this train only for uh, this to, to, to visit those trains. In China, uh, they uh, developed uh, two separate uh, high-speed maglev trains. I, I'm not going in detail. Um, and uh, uh, they are uh, using uh, uh, currently, the Shanghai Maglev train that is operating at a speed of 430 kilometers per hour to connect uh, uh, the international airport in Shanghai with uh, uh, the road uh, station in the same city. It's about 30.5 30 kilometers distance. Hyperloop is a new technology. Um, Elon Musk uh, was using this technology, this term. And uh, do you know how old is the idea of uh, uh, Hyperloop? Unfortunately, it was not hidden the rest. So you can see, maybe I have not asked this. So let's uh, go on. 
It has been developed, this idea, in 1799 by the engineer uh, George Methurst uh, from UK. Uh, and uh, this concept is uh, open source, that means everybody can use it. So the University in Munich, uh, they have developed a Hyperloop set that reached uh, uh, in 2019 a speed of 100, 463 kilometers per hour. Virgin conducted the first trial with humans in Las Vegas, reaching a top speed of 172 kilometers per hour. So some milestones uh, uh, for the railway history. 600 years before Christi, the first uh, um, uh, the Diolcos, then the horse-drawn uh, wagons in uh, 1800, then 1814, uh, the steam-powered locomotive, later on, the first high-speed train with steam, uh, in 1964, uh, the Tokaido, the Shinkansen uh, train, and uh, the trains today, high-speed trains that can reach speeds over 300 kilometers per hour. The technologies is high-speed trains, Hyperloop, and Maglev. So I will continue with uh, a brief introduction to the history in the Baltic countries. The Baltic countries are three, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Estonia is the north, we start with Estonia. They've uh, built the first line connecting Tallinn to Narva. You see the uh, line in red in 1870. The distance is uh, 195 kilometers. So they developed uh, after that uh, the railway network uh, in the country. And uh, today uh, there is uh, a network of 1,200 kilometers of lines. You can see here a, a locomotive uh, 1930. And on the right side, Parnu. In Parnu, uh, it's the old station. Uh, we will build, let's say, Baltica, a new international railway station. In Latvia, uh, it was uh, built uh, almost the same time as in Estonia in 1861, a line 160 kilometers per hour, you see in red. And uh, they continue to develop the railway network. And uh, currently, the railway network has a length of 1,860 kilometers. You can see uh, two photos. The left is uh, the first train to Jurmala a very nice city close to Riga, and uh, on the right, a uh, historic Latin uh, uh, town, the train to uh, Aluxne. In Lithuania, at the same time as in Estonia, in 1860, they started building the railway line connecting uh, counters with Vilnius. You see the line in red, and uh, there is a total uh, currently of uh, 1,910 kilometers of railway. In all three countries, they have the broad gauge, you see here the construction of Kaunas railway tunnel, the Vilnius railway station 100 years ago, and the heart of a watchman of uh, Lithuanian railways. So in Rail Baltica, we are using, uh, we are now planning uh, uh, the new high speed line, uh, mixed high speed line, 249 kilometers per hour and uh, for freight. The idea started in 1994, uh, where this idea has been discussed at the European Transport Conference. In 2003, uh, the Commission, European Commission adds uh, Rail Baltica to the priority list. In 2011, uh, it was conducted a feasibility study. And three years later, Rail Baltica Rail has been established, a joint stock company. Uh, one year later, uh, it was the first grant of the CEF, Connecting Europe Facility, the financing scheme. In 2017, uh, a CBA has been contacted, uh, conducted with a positive outlook. And in 2019, uh, 
uh, they, Real Baltica, we started to sign the first design contracts for the main line. Uh, one year later, the construction began in all three Baltic states, some certain parts. And uh, we plan uh, to deliver the project uh, in 2030. That are the milestones. Uh, it's a very important uh, um, uh, line. It's part of the North Sea Baltic Sea 10 T corridor. It's also the corridor that connecting uh, the Baltic Sea, the Black Sea, going down to Aegean Sea. And is the basis for a new economic and security corridor in the Baltic region and European Union. Maturity is a precondition for using the momentum and opportunities. You see here uh, the uh, line. Uh, we have uh, in uh, green the high speed trains running from Tallinn uh, until uh, Warsaw is planned. Uh, also, with uh, nine trains that can uh, continue to Berlin, uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Vienna, and also freight trains, uh, uh, also with huge connection to Helsinki, starting from Munga, uh, close to Tallinn, and uh, going uh, to Vilnius and to Warsaw. Uh, in 2026, is also planned a tunnel to Helsinki. Uh, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, I'm not going too much in detail. Uh, there is a cost, but the socioeconomic benefits are higher. That means uh, uh, there is a plus of 18.2 billion euros uh, total benefits. We are started a new cost benefit analysis that plans, uh, is planned to be completed in 2024. That will update those figures. We have strong partnership, partners uh, with uh, um, uh, many uh, companies, over 150 active contracts in a total value of uh, over 1 billion euros. And uh, we are focused on building long-term strategic partnerships and commitments. So uh, I will conclude with a funny story about the railway track goals, the space shuttle and the horses behind. So, uh, we'll discuss what is the relation between railway track gauge, the space shuttle, and the horses behind. I have two questions, but I think because of lack of time, uh, I will uh, reply on that. What is the track, st the track standard gauge? is 1435 millimeters. And we'll also discuss what is the relation between the railway track goals and the Roman chariots. So the Romans, they built uh, um, uh, locked instance roads in Europe for their army. And uh, they used uh, um, uh, uh, roads uh, that uh, can uh, everybody use. Uh, uh, so, but without destroying the wagon wheels. Uh, road cutting, rutting was uh, common in later roads, uh, and even in old times, in Neolithic uh, uh, time, the wheeled uh, carts they found in Europe, they had a gauge 1.3 to 1.75 meters. In the Bronze Age, about 2000 uh, years before Christi, to 700 years before Christi, the uh, goals appear to have stabilized between 1.4 and 1.45 meters. That means very, very close to the standard goals we have now. The ancient Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and Greeks, they constructed roads with uh, rats cut in the rocks. And the goals in those stone grooves was 1.38 to 1.44. In Diolcos, that we presented some time ago, they had a, a, a gauge of 1.67 meters. So the Roman Empire used uh, those roads uh, even to England when they uh, con uh, conquered Britain in uh, year 43 after Christi. So uh, they continue to use this uh, gauge. Uh, with animal drawn vehicles, and the goal was 1.4 to 1.5 meters. 
And uh, in 1814, uh, Joe Stephenson, they used this uh, gauge, extended, widened a little bit, and uh, he used the uh, gauge of uh, 1,435 millimeters. That is the standard gauge now. Conclusion. The standard railroad gauge of 1435 derives from the original specification for Imperial Roman Army War Chariot and specification and bureaucracies live forever. Now let's go to the space shuttle. Uh, when we see the space shuttle on the right, we see two big booster on both sides of the main. And uh, uh, these are the solid rocket boosters or as RBS. Those are made by the company Tiocol, that is a factory close to Utah. The engineers who, desi who, uh, who designed the SRBs may have preferred to make them a bit fatter, but uh, they have to be shipped by train from the factory to the launch site. But there is a tunnel, and uh, the train has to pass through the tunnel. So uh, the tunnel is slightly wider than a railroad track, and uh, the railroad track is about as wide as two horses behind, because they have to be as the Roman war chariots. So a major design feature of what is perhaps the world's most advanced transportation system, the space shuttle, was originally determined by the width of the horses behind. So, and you thought the horse behind is not so important? It is. So, thank you. And I don't know if you have some questions to share. We have uh, two or three minutes. Uh, what lessons can be learned from the history of railways to inform the development and implementation of Rail Baltica? It's uh, something that uh, very interesting questions. Um, can you show again the question? I think it's not easy to reply in, in two minutes we have. Uh, we have to use... Uh, uh, to, to, to apply the most uh, uh, developed uh, technology in order to have uh, a, an efficient railway. That means uh, efficient in uh, reaching the top speed that's possible also with uh, less maintenance. Can we see the next uh, questions? Can you name any remarkable railway project or routes that played a crucial role in European history? Yes, so there are a lot of projects uh, uh, in Italy, uh, in France, and also in Germany. Can we go down? Uh, uh, what country has the best uh, uh, efficient railway system nowadays? I, I think uh, Japan, uh, Spain, Germany, France, and also China. Uh, in Rail Baltica, there are about uh, 230 people, but we have also the implementing bodies that means they are working also for El Baltica. I'm not sure about the number of the staff they have. Uh, future innovation trends that we expect to see in the railway industry. A good question. Uh, we are expecting to have a lot uh, of uh, innovations, not only for the trains, uh, also battery, hydrogen trains, and also for the maintenance, also using artificial intelligence.
and uh, now we reached uh, the time. It's now three o'clock. Thank you very much for joining today's lecture. Thank you.